At the First Vatican Council, the Catholic Church taught that the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas should be perennial in the Catholic Church. What this doesn't mean is that St. Thomas Aquinas was right about everything. And it also doesn't mean that we can't study other philosophies which can enrich our faith and help us dive deeper into divine revelation. However, it does mean that the Church prefers to teach St. Thomas Aquinas because it is one of the most effective ways to explain what the Church believes and why it does. In fact, in canon law, there's only really two classes that the Church says must be taught in a seminary. One is Latin, and one is the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. And so, with knowing that St. Thomas is important, it's important for us, as we begin speaking about morality, to go into how he explains it, and I found it very helpful. Before we begin speaking about morality, I'd like to stress two cautions before speaking about morality at all. The first caution is what Pope Benedict would call moralism. And the second caution is what I would call popular values. So in regard to moralism, Pope Benedict explained that one of the dangers of our Catholic faith is to reduce religion to being nothing more than a matter of precepts of the difference between right and wrong. The reason why he cautions us against this is because what we lose in just discussing our faith in terms of morality is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian is all about having a personal relationship with God as individuals and as a community. And so when we only focus on the difference between right and wrong, we can fall into all sorts of errors like legalism or the heresy of Pelagianism, where we're trying to simply receive a reward by good behavior, but it's not because we love God and it's not because we love our neighbor. And so what God wants us to do is he wants us to reflect on morality in the context of a loving, joyful relationship with God. And sometimes I think there's a disconnect between these two theologies. And so what we need to do is allow them to be integrated into one another. And that's why the context of morality should always be studied in relationship to God and our neighbor. That ultimately is the summary of everything that Jesus taught us. The second caution, as I mentioned, has more to do with a popular ideology or a popular value system. Sometimes what can happen is the human heart wants to belong to a community. And that's common. And in fact, the fear of being alone and isolated can really plague our mind and kind of cloud it from the ability to discern the difference between right and wrong or truth and falsity. And this is why cults can be very effective. Cults prey on people that are vulnerable, isolated, and alone. And they give them everything that they're longing for, a sense of fellowship, community, offering them the sense of belonging. And once they have them and they're drawing them close, then they give them all sorts of teachings that are often very obscure. And we might wonder, how in the world did you ever come to believe this? It's superstitious. It doesn't make any sense, it's hateful, et cetera, et cetera. But often the reason why as human beings we can be so blinded to those doctrines is because we're immersed in a community where everyone just believes it. And deeply underneath that, we don't want to reject that teaching because that community will shun us if we disagree with them. Now, the Catholic Church doesn't believe in shunning. Even in its teaching of excommunication, it also teaches that Jesus left the 99 for the one, and that anyone who falls away from the church should be pursued with love and affection. And so we have to be careful and really be honest with ourselves and ask the question, why do I believe what I believe? Is it merely to just feel like I belong, or do I believe that it's actually the truth? So what is the authority that's guiding us in this discernment of the difference between right and wrong? Well, the Catholic Church believes that the authority isn't itself, 
but rather God. And so God reveals to us truth and the church is only there to preserve that teaching and to surrender to it. And so what are the ways that we can come to know the truth? Well, we can come to know the truth of God through faith and reason. St. Thomas Aquinas beautifully marries these two realities in his own philosophy, and that's why we're going to reflect on him today. Beginning with reason, I'd like to offer just today three principles on the difference between right and wrong. St. Thomas says that there are three things that happen in any moral action and that they have to be in a perfect harmony with each other. If one of them is just a little bit off, the whole act becomes bad. So what do we know about morality? Well, there's three things. One is an intention. The second is that there's an action that takes place. And the third is that there's a circumstance. Now you'll notice in human law, we often refer to these things as circumstantial evidence, as uh, mens rea, that's the intention, and actus reus. And so all three of these things are founding blocks to civilization and trying to figure out, you know, if there's guilt for something or innocence. It's very practical and reasonable. In fact, St. Thomas says that law, human law, is an ordinance of human reason. It's not an ordinance of what people think is popularly a value. It has to be grounded in reality. And so when we reflect on the morality of the intention, the circumstance, and of course the act itself, all three of these need to be in harmony together. So I'd like to break that down using examples. A good act might be me going to a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen and serving food to the people in order to uh, support them and encourage them and give them what is truly just for them. Now in that act, I have the intention of serving and caring for these people and the act itself is I'm feeding them. So I'm not just saying be clothed and well fed, good luck, but rather what I'm doing is I'm actually living out what I want them to experience. And the third is that I haven't broken into someone else's house and started feeding the homeless their own food, but I've gone to a place at a time where it's relevant and there's an opportunity, of course, to feed them. Now, things go wrong, like I said, when we just change one of those examples. So sometimes we'll say, well, all that matters is in the intention. But here's an example where it proves that wrong. What if I want the poor to have money? So I go to a bank, which is a great place, by the way, to get money, but I rob it. Well, stealing from other people in order to support the poor isn't the right way to go about doing it. Doing something evil to accomplish something good is always wrong. The ends doesn't justify the means. Second of all, what if the circumstance is a little messed up? Right? So let's say I want to get exercise. Being healthy is important. So I'm skipping rope. That's good cardio. And of course, I'm doing it with the intention of being healthy, not for vanity's sake. But what if I'm doing it in the sanctuary at church during mass? Well, that's sacrilegious, of course. And so we know that there's a time and a place for certain things, as my mother would always say, and that's not the time or the place. And so circumstances are important as well. We also know that the intention has to be there. It has to be loving. What if I'm at the soup kitchen and I'm feeding the poor and I'm doing it in the right place, but I'm only doing it so that people will think better of me for it? Well, then I'm doing the exact opposite of love. I'm using people for my own ego. And that I think most people can see through and they often feel less loved. And Jesus teaches us that people don't hunger for bread alone. They hunger for the word that comes from the Father's mouth, which is Jesus Christ, who is love and who is truth. And so when we're reflecting on morality, we have to make sure that all three of these things are in a good, harmonious relationship with one another. If one of them is off, it all becomes a bad act. Let's develop the habit of looking at even the small actions in our life breaking them into those three categories and asking ourselves, what's my intention? Really though, what is my intention? And what am I doing? Is it 
reasonable? Is it the right action to fit the intention? Is it evil to accomplish a good? Or is it good? And third, is this the time or the place for it? Maybe I'm really zealous about doing something good, but I'm not taking a pause in a moment to reflect on how to do it at the proper time. This is what helps us examine the whole spectrum of morality. morality.